Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. I'm joined today by James Junkin, Very Force Master Trainer and President of Mariner Golf Consulting and Services, which is a full service international environmental safety and health risk management firm. We're going to talk about some of the challenges of getting contractors today in the environment we face with labor shortages and crises and how that ties to safety and materials and the overall environment, especially in the field service area. So James, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be an honor to be here. So my first question for you is in a world where simply getting contractors is a huge victory, how can you make sure that they meet minimum safety standards? That's an excellent question. I mean, the pandemic has really revealed how fragile the supply chain really is. I mean, right now, finding a contractor that has the minimum number of workers that are necessary to complete the job on time and on budget is really considered a win. Coming out of last year, we thought the COVID pandemic was improving, but now we have the Omicron variant, right? And that's reminded us that the pandemic is not over. And that just increases the risk of you know, significant absenteeism, which wrecks budgets and schedules and, and can really substantially generate safety risk and risk not just found in the virus itself, but the risk generated from the necessity to keep operations going uh, by using poorly trained and quickly installed replacement workers, uh, underqualified workers, and selecting contractor companies that really do not have a, a resilient safety management system. And, and that's where a, a dynamic system for contractor pre-qualification can be a real asset to hiring clients. So using a, a third-party system like Fair Forces, for example, uh, allows hiring clients to dig deeper into a contractor safety management system and better understand the qualification factors of the contractors that they're selecting, things like uh, regulatory history, have they got a number of OSHA citations, their various personal injury statistics. Uh, it allows you to look into their safety policies and, and procedures, safety and health manual, if you will, uh, as well as worker training and qualification. So I recommend, as an answer to your question, a third-party qualification system uh, such as one that we use like at Verforce that allows hiring clients to anticipate the safety problems that a contractor may experience prior to that contractor being awarded a contract to perform work. And in doing so, you can make a risk-based decision to either work with that contractor, help that contractor with a corrective action plan, or switch to another contractor. So either way, using a pre-qualification system, in my opinion, is the only economically sound method to ensure that contractors are meeting minimum safety standards. Uh, you know, after the contract is let, it's real important for hiring clients to follow up with a robust audit program for their contractors to make sure that they're meeting contractual and regulatory requirements and performing their work safely. And again, these are proactive approaches to make sure that we're identifying problems before an incident happens and using that as a preventative measure to prevent future incident and accidents from occurring. And that should be a good business practice anytime, but the pandemic and the effects on the pandemic have really created the importance to make good decisions when, when adding contractors to your supply chain. So one thing I'm really curious about is in today's environment, you know, finding workers can be hard enough and some of the suppliers you might be working with could be sold out, they could be elsewhere, same state or even a different part of the country. So if your existing contractors that you're working with on a given job site facility are not available, what are some tips for rapidly qualifying new suppliers around safety, which you would recommend? That's a great question because that question was actually asked of me very early on in 2020. And the question really is, what do we do if our current suppliers cannot meet our demands? So I'll respond to that now basically as I did then. Companies, especially those that rely heavily on their supply chains for either workforce uh, contract work or their supply chain is based on some sort of just-in-time delivery type model, 
they really need to develop a well thought out business continuity plan. And when we think of business continuity plans, we often internalize that plan without fully considering the effects brought on to us by contractors uh, through supply chain disruption. So I recommend that companies be engaged with their contractors and integrate their contractors into their business continuity plans. It doesn't really matter if I can keep the power on at my plant. If I can supplement the workforce with retirees and temps and do all that, be prepared to go to work if the parts I need don't show up to allow those workers to do the job. So basically an integrated approach to business continuity means including the supply chain in the discussion, maintaining open lines of communication so your suppliers can anticipate problems they're having, communicate it up the chain to you, Communication flows downward, understanding where everybody's strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats are, and planning some redundancies uh, to uh, take care of any anticipated or unanticipated type disruptions. Now, that being said, we like to think work is linear. Like we can sit down and we can plan the work, workers do the work, and the work goes on as designed. And that, that simply is rarely the case. The work, environment is dynamic. And despite the best planning we can do, a contractor may simply be unable to fulfill its contractual requirements. So that means qualifying a new contractor quickly in order to avoid work disruption. And that's where using a company such as Veriforce really speeds up the process of contractor selection. Uh, inside the Veriforce network is thousands, thousands of pre-qualified contractors which hiring clients can choose from. So let's say a hiring client, for example, needs a qualified asbestos remediation contractor that's located within 50 miles of Houston, Texas. Using a system such as Veriforce allows hiring clients the access to technology to discover who is available, who's been pre-qualified to safely perform the work, who has qualified workers. And that is definitely a more economical, timely and risk-based approach than using word of mouth, internet searches and manual qualifications. And it really ensures uh, th that you're selecting the best contractor available and one that does not pose serious safety concerns. So one question I have around safety in kind of this post COVID area, call it a pandemic or endemic or wherever we are today, but in the mad dash, to simply fix or produce, as I like to break down you know, the world of production, finding folks is hard enough. And in a world where you know, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody saw it, did it really fall? I'm curious about, are you seeing at all uh, kind of cutting corners around safety given the supply constraints? Or are you seeing suppliers cut corners if they're not being watched? I guess is the best way to put it. Well, historically, that, that has been a problem, and the pandemic has just exasperated it. So the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, they just recently released its injury and fatality numbers for 2020. Now, as you probably can expect, the injury and fatality rates were down in 2020, and that's directly related to the pandemic, work-from-home initiatives, pandemic shutdowns of businesses, the lagging economy, et cetera. Now, that being said, even in that situation in 2020, where we had the work from home environments and we had the shutdowns of businesses, there were still 2,654,700 worker injuries in 2020 that required treatment beyond first aid. The work-related fatality data has come out for 2020, and it has shown a 1% or so decrease from 2019, but in 2019, we saw an increase in worker fatalities to 5,333 here in the United States. Now that was pre-pandemic with the supply chain unhampered by the effects of COVID-19. In the current 2021 physical year, which ended in October, OSHA wrote 33,393 citations. In the state OSHA plans, they wrote 42,063 citations. So that combined equals over 75,000 OSHA citations in a recovering economy. That's a lot of citations. So when you see the top 10 most cited standards, it's the same old cast of characters 
from previous years. The rankings may change, but the safety violations stay the same. Fall protection, hazard communication, scaffolding, lockout, tag out, uh, machine guarding, ladders, respiratory protection, eye and face protection. They, they round out the top 10. And depending on the year, one may be ranked higher than another, et cetera. But that's pretty much the same ones that have been historically in the top 10 for years. And each of those violations has a potential for serious injury or fatality to workers. The pandemic has placed an especially uh, large strain on the workforce. I mean, the pandemic, when you combine it with the natural aging out of more experienced workers from the workforces, leaving in many cases, the lack of training for new workers in areas related to occupational safety and health, all that's been a contributing factor to workplace safety instances. So companies out there, as we've been talking about, rush to get staffing levels up, rushing to get workers to fulfill contractual requirements. What I find is often that the training is either not robust enough or it's not completed at all. And that creates a real risk within the supply chain for hiring clients. So that's why it's good to have a good pre-qualification of contractors followed by a thorough audit of their performance in order to prevent serious injuries and fatalities and safety issues among your contractor workforce. Incredibly insightful. You know, as you were talking, I was just going over some of the statistics in front of me. You know, unfortunately, they're dating back to 2019, but it sounds like very similar in 2020. We'll, we'll probably see similar things in 2021. But in 2019, you know, we saw 3.5 fatalities per 100,000 full-time workers, and that was up from the previous year. Um, in terms of injuries, 2.8 per 100 full-time workers, which, you know, remained the same in 2019. So, you know, certainly in an era where we're dealing with qualifying newer suppliers faster and simply getting labor, the more we can monitor what's happening and the more we can ensure that people know that they're being watched um, at the beginning and that they're going to do the right thing for their employees and for us because of our risk at different levels in the supply chain further up really makes a difference. So final question, you know, is not just about skilled or unskilled labor. It has to do with the materials we use to uh, whether we're working on capital equipment, fixing it, whether we're, you know, on, on a specific job site. So are there any, you know, specific material supply constraints as we think about the supply chain today impacting the compliance practices themselves? So it could be any type of safety gear, um, safety supplies, substitute materials, chemicals, reagents, any of that stuff. Just curious about your view on the actual material side of the supply chain impacting safety. Sure. I think it's improving. If you go back to the height of the pandemic, there were serious supply issues related to PPE. Uh, take one everyone knows about, the N95 mask, for example, which were used by healthcare professionals, but they're also used as a form of respiratory protection in certain occupational safety and health settings. I guess in the first 90 days or so of the pandemic, the supply of those masks that met the standards of NIOSH ground to a halt. And you saw many, many counterfeit products enter the marketplace. So I have concerns about counterfeit products of all safety gear, particularly PPE. And as the supply chain is, is sort of emerging from the pandemic, we're seeing less and less issues related to being able to purchase high quality safety supplies. Now, that being said, we're coming into the winter months and we have this new COVID-19 variant that's potentially impacting supplies and suppliers across the spectrum of PPE and safety products. So prudent companies, they should be replenishing their safety supply inventories right now. And they should be considering potential supply disruptions as part of their business continuity plans. I know we wanna put the pandemic behind us, but the virus gets a vote. So while you may have concluded that the pandemic is over and your area of the country may be improving, we are starting to see numbers uh, as of the last few days, uh, record numbers of COVID-19 infections from the variant. This is a global economy and a global supply chain. Events that, that happen beyond our borders can have a tremendous impact on supply and safety issues, and we've already seen that. So we, we must remain vigilant and proactive when planning our hazard controls, 
Hazards are best controlled in the design phase of the work. So if you don't have to depend on PPE, uh, particularly as it relates to the virus, if you, for example, you can isolate workers, we can provide a more effective means to stopping the spread of the virus through our own workforces. Isolation prevents direct exposure. PPE is nothing more than a barrier between the worker and the hazard, in this case, the virus and the person. So remember, even in the best situation, PPE can fail. Workers can wear the PPE wrong. You know, it can, it can wear out. So prudent companies should be looking for controls and protections that they can implement to protect workers above the level of PPE. And that's true for any hazard not just the, the virus, even though I've been talking about the virus. Prudent companies should be looking at hazard controls above the level of PPE. That is the best practice when it comes to safety for protection of the workforce. And it's probably the most economical and prudent way to deal with potential supply disruptions down the road. So I'd be building some safety stock uh, within the company. And I would also be looking to control hazards uh, in the design of the work itself. James, thank you so much for joining us. Incredibly insightful and look forward to the next time we speak. Thank you for having me. And again, everyone work safe and take care of each other and we'll get through this.